Welcome to this week's edition of Trainers Underground. Uh, John Hone and myself are here today, Don Hester. Um, we may be joined later on by Brian or Robert. Not sure where they are, but it is the weekend before Thanksgiving, so or the week before Thanksgiving, so you know how that goes. Um, so today I thought what we could talk about is uh, a book I was just reading called The Second Machine Age. Uh, and there was some really interesting uh, talk in it because a lot of people uh, seem to think that uh, when AI and robots start taking over, that somehow there's going to be, you know, some dystopia or something. They, they think of Terminator when they think of, um, you know, uh, robots and computers working together or AI and uh, robots working together. And interesting thing is, and I think I mentioned this previously, that in uh, the, the town I work in, they are now test driving the Starship robots, which are little delivery robots. And those robots will uh, deliver food. And I think it's up to three miles or something like that. So it's not like a great distance, but you're able to... Um, order pizza and then have it delivered within three miles. Obviously it doesn't go up escalators as far as I know. <laughs> I think it goes down to the bottom floor of a building and then you have to kind of tell it where you want to go or you, you have to come down and pick up the pizza or whatever it has inside of it. But I was driving my car the other day and I was going to um, a, a dealership to drop my car off because I was having problems with it. And driving, just getting ready to make a U-turn so that I can get into the driveway. And waiting to cross the street was one of the robots. And then a week later, I saw one in the parking lot of my office building. So I was like, "Whoa, this is kind of cool." Now they're all. So now I'm seeing them all over the place. But the thing is, the robots are here, right? And so AI is kind of running those things. So the question is, what does this leave? So one of the questions that came up on a video that I watched is, what's going to happen to all the delivery drivers for pizza? Are they all going to lose their jobs? Well, first of all, uh, Starship uh, – well, actually, no, Starship – I don't know, I, keep on, I, keep on, I want to say Starship Enterprises, but whatever it is, Starship Robotics or whatever they're called, um, they they talk about – um, how it's not going to, you're not going to lose jobs because they're, although they will replace some drivers, they're not going to replace all because they can only carry like two or three pizzas. Um, they can only have a three mile range. So anything that's going to be more difficult than that is going to have to be handled by humans. So if somebody's ordering pizzas for their work party or something like that, and they need 15 pizzas, well, the robots can't do those. Um, so they're saying that we don't have to worry about, you know, pizza delivery boys don't have to worry about it just yet. And they're just testing it out at this point in time. But I mean, I guess if you had a career in pizza delivery, you might want to rethink it. <laughs> um, oh, anyways. Um, so uh, it, there's, there's some interesting things now that they talked about in the book. And one of the things that they talked about that I thought was really interesting is that, uh, you look at the first machine age and the first machine age is when the steam engine came on line and you found that once it came on, it kind of revolutionized the way uh, manual labor was done. And so for the most part, manual labor was augmented um, with the power of steam engines. And then over time, the steam engines got better and better and things kind of grew at not necessarily an exponential rate, but they talk about how it, it, it you know, one piece of technology is combined with another piece of technology, and now you can go further. And so the, the steam engine eventually went into the internal combustion engine, and, and now we're getting into electric motors. Um, and so there's been this progress from steam to uh, fuel to just uh, uh, electricity. So we're kind of moving up this, you know, more technologically advanced. Uh, we couldn't get to the electric car until we had something, you know, as a precursor. But then we took these uh, technologies and combined them together. And they talk a lot about combining technologies together in the book, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so what they're talking about is that first age kind of helped with the manual labor. There was a, a concern during the Industrial Revolution that, you know, is it going to take away jobs? And certainly when robots first came on the scene in factories, there was a concern that factory workers were now uh, going to be obsolete. However, that's not been the case. They're still factory workers because the robots in most factories 
are very specific. The bottle has to be in the right location for the arm to pick it up, to put it into the uh, another location or to fill, you know, fill it up and, you know, put a lid on it, whatever it is, it has to be, there's very, not very much room for, you know, the tolerances are very narrow. And so you have to have that. So typically where you still find people in the uh, floor on the factory is if the machine senses that the wheel it's about to put on the car is not oriented correctly for it to pick it up, it will signal for an operator to come to reorient uh, that tire so that it can then be picked up and put onto the car. Um, so factory workers are taking care of those types of jobs in the factory. Plus another one is like, let's say you're going to have bottles or cans that are going to go on a conveyor belt and they're going to get filled up with food and get, you know, closed and all that stuff. Getting the uh, raw materials, the glass bottles or whatever, out of a box and on the conveyor belt is still done by humans because robots are, one, too slow, and two, uh, because the box can be in all kinds of different orientations and the bottles might be loose inside the box, it's hard for a robot to pick it up and stick it on a conveyor belt. So what they found is... Um, uh, what they found was that humans were better off doing those types of things uh, than uh, robots. So they don't think that those types of jobs are going to be taken care of. Now, what happens if you have broken material? Oh, for the robots, they would just, it, well, it depends, I guess. I guess it depends if there is a sensor and the sensor goes off and then it just turns it off, you know, well, and it calls a... Uh, well, like a good example you just mentioned was a box full of bottles. What happens if one of the bottles is broken halfway down? So the top of the bottle is still in a, you know, solid, right? It's not broken. So gotcha, yeah. the, the robotic arm could still sense that it's there, but does it have, does the robot have the capability or has it been designed with the capability to sense the weight disparity of a broken bottle versus a, a, a complete bottle that is intact? Right. And that would be one of those indicators where it would sense that it would put the rest of the bottles down, but hold on to that broken one and then call for, you know, a maintenance worker to come over to take that, that broken bottle away. Or does it have, will it have the capabilities to put it in a disposing box? That's a good question. I mean, when they wrote this book, it was like two years ago or so, I think, uh, if I don't re if I remember correctly, I think it was 2014 or something. So it, it's, it's recent, but not too recent. In fact, some of the stuff they talked about in the book has already been surpassed. So it's, it's, it's really interesting just to hear, you know, just from like two years ago or two and a half years ago, what they thought things were going to be like, or how long it was going to take for certain things to happen and them happening. On the factory floor, they don't really talk a whole lot about that, but I would imagine they do because they did talk about a lot of the robots have sensors on them, um, and one of the sensors that I'm familiar with is weight, um, so I would imagine they would have that. However, at the at the time of the publish and when they talked about it, they are those jobs are not safe <laughs> because there's new robots and a new company working on a robot that has a lighter touch uh, that has. Uh, all the different types of sensors, such as uh, sight or, or you know, uh, visual uh, and auditory and uh, other types of sensors. And a human could go to that robot because it, it's a general purpose robot. It's not a specific purpose robot and show that robot how to pick up the bottle and stick it on the conveyor belt. And then that robot can then learn it's using AI to do this. So AI and robot being combined takes that dumb arm and the, uh, the thing that can't figure out what to do other than call for help and turning it into something that can learn and it can be general purpose. So this is the new big thing that we're seeing happening is that the robots are not just going to be, um, you know, dumb things that just pick up things and put a bolt on a car or anything. Like, no, they're going to be smart. They're going to be able to figure out and say, oh, the bolts are missing. Hey, are, are they getting low? And they're going to call another robot that's going to go grab them off the shelf, go bring them over and put them in the place for the dumb arm maybe to put it on to the machine. So you're going to see different levels of robots, I think, ones that have AI behind them, ones that are just dumb and just do what they're told. And you're still going to have to have people verifying that the AI is doing what it's supposed to be doing and the robots are doing what they're doing and train them initially. But there's a huge thing here uh, is that there's going to be a, a, a less factory workers, period. Uh, and that's one of the things that doesn't look like is going to be saved through all of that. 
So then the question becomes, how close are we to Skynet? <laughs> well, the, the, you, you bring I up. I mean, if you, if you if you're attaching AI to robotics, right? And if AI has already gone through the process of, and we've talked about this in a previous episode where AI has learned and created its own language, right? Before it was, um, you know, turned off. How soon is it before that the AI that's attached to a robot that's helping another robot starts to develop its own robots to do its own tasking? Oh, I, I'm sure that's – I mean, I, I've totally got this whole science fiction book in my head where that would happen. Uh, maybe I'll write it one day. Um, but um, but you're right. I mean, they do talk about and they say there's this idea that there's a dystopia. In other words, that their machines are going to rise up and, and take us over. Um, that's one way to look at it, and that's the way certainly Elon Musk looks at it. Um, and uh, – and you can see other people on the other side of the spectrum who are looking at, well, you know, computers are actually going to help us. They talk a lot in the book about um, things like policy that needs to happen at the government level in order to protect jobs and that type of thing, which is kind of important because what you're going to have with this is there's going to be a disparity gap between the haves and have-nots. So if you are – and they had some really interesting terminology here that I um, – uh, let me look at it really quick because it was something like uh, – uh, technologically, tech, uh, something about technological impact. Uh, oh, skills-based, skills-biased technology change. In other words, if you don't have the skills, the technical skills, in order to adapt to the new AI or robots or whatever that's going to be there or be able to program them or be able to work with them, then you're going to be at a disadvantage in your career. So what I got really from the book is computer science better be something that you studied somewhere along the lines. Uh, and you better be com comfortable with change and you better be uh, looking to the future and seeing if your job is automatable. Because the second machine age, after we talked about the first machine age, that second machine age is really talking about not the manual labor aspect, although it's going to be augmented through this uh, with smarter robots on the factory floor, but also intellectual labor, the labor that we that humans have done because we've had to make decisions is now more and increasingly going towards things like artificial intelligence. So the concern there is then those middle class jobs are now going to start to become more uh, they're going to start disappearing. Uh, one of the uh, – a, a guy that I know that's an accountant, he does tax returns, and he said he was just at a meeting because I was reading this book, and I was telling him as I was going through the book what I was reading. And he said, well, I was just at this meeting, and they said tax preparers are gone. He said, oh, our career field's ending because tax preparation it can be automated now. Um, it, you know, you got things like TurboTax, so you can go online and do your taxes. Most people don't do it, uh, except most of the people that have very complex tax returns or they have some amount of deductions have to uh, typically go to prepare to make sure they're getting all their deductions. But uh, if they flatten the tax code or simplify it, then those preparers aren't going to be needed for those things um, because you know, through a, a simple set of questionnaires, it can do your taxes. Plus, the IRS gets all the information. So he learned at this event that they were saying that your job as a taxpayer is um, dead on arrival. He says, and, and the, the person at the conference wasn't talking about AI, but I'm sure TurboTax does not have very sophisticated AI behind it trying to look for deductions or anything like that. Somebody is going to come up with that. That's a million-dollar idea. I should have, like, trademarked it or something. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> patented it. Uh, but, so that's going to happen. You can think about anything and applying AI to it. And that's what the future is about. So that kind of thing. So they're telling him you need to be a tax advisor, uh, something that you can do to uh, still do stuff for people that people because you're going to be able to talk to them. You're going to be able to do things that the um, AI is not going to be able to do for now. Right. I, and I think you just said the difference there. So the difference being a tax preparer versus being a tax advisor 
right? Because the AI, like you said, the AI is not going to be able to advise somebody on tax deductions on what they can and can't claim and things like that, right? And they're not going to know the specifics of individual estates. But a tax advisor would know how to interpret a estate from an individual or a family and be able to apply the rules accordingly and then give advice on what they can claim for deductions and what they can't. And I think what would end up happening is the advisor would then tell them like, here the here's the key pieces of information, right, dollar amounts or whatever have you, uh, that you need to present to the uh, automated system, whether it's, you know, TurboTax or whatever. When it asks you for uh, details on, you know, different um, tax claims or exceptions you need to make, Here's the, here's the dollar amounts that you have to put into these particular uh, forms or fields or what have you. And then the tax preparer would just simply calculate the rest of it and spit out the end result. I think that's the key difference between the preparer versus the advisor. And I think you'll see that with a lot of the professions that could, those same tasks can be automated in that same format. You would have, instead of being the the person who was preparing those things, you're now going to be the person who is advising the, the, the consumer at that level. Well, you know, it's just like, um, and, and I think you think about this, any website, that it, any job that can be put to a website, your job is toast. And you're going to have to adapt somehow to bring value add that the AI can't bring. Um, the question is, right now, the AI um, would have to read the whole entire tax code and have to understand it like a human understands it. And there is, I work with accountants, so I know, there's wiggle room in a lot of the regulations, right? And I don't know that the AI would be able to handle that. So for people looking for tax loopholes and stuff like that or different ways of combining what the law is, um, like on estate planning and stuff like that, you probably still need a human to do that kind of stuff because there's a little bit of creativity to it. Um, while I'm sure the IRS doesn't think that there's creativity to it, there is because the way the lawmakers write the laws kind of leave some ambiguity into it. So people take advantage of that. That's the stuff that the AI is not going to be good at. So, but here's the thing, the number of tax preparers or number of uh, tax advisors that they're going to become is going to drastically reduce. Same thing happens with, uh, um, what do you call it, the travel uh, agencies and stuff like that, they kind of went out of business because you can do it yourself for the most part. I mean, unless you don't want to read all the travel blogs and try and do all the research, to, I mean, because some of them still exist because people just don't want to do the research. They're like, you know, I want to do a nice vacation somewhere in the South Pacific. Okay, well, and I don't want to have to look online and try and figure anything out. Just find me the best deal, right? So there's going to be those types of people, right? And I, what was it? I mean, Costco has like that service now too. So you, you're going to find that those type of jobs um, are going to become fewer. And so they're talking about, they were talking about like the rock stars, whatever you're doing, you have to be a rock star at it because if you're going to be uh, a travel advisor, you've got to be a rock star. Otherwise the websites can handle your job. So, and with AI behind things, and there really wasn't AI behind a lot of the travel sites. It was just that it could be ported to a website. They said jobs like hairdresser, janitor, because there's a lot of small, easy decision points that AI has, they don't see in the future soon being able to handle those things or being able to be like a nurse and help a person um, because, you know, just having that human touch when someone's sick and all those types of things, those types of jobs are not going to go away. Uh, they're recommending that people uh, and policymakers kind of figure out a way where machines and humans can, you know, work side by side. And they have all kinds of different ideas for it. Um, but it's not, they don't view it as a dystopia. They think it could become a dystopia where, you know, something can happen, but they're, they're definitely not in that group of people saying that, you know, the end's coming, all jobs are lost, but they do say there's a very strong risk and likelihood that there's going to be a larger gap between the haves and the have nots. And that has to do with how well people use technology or how well they com recombine technologies uh, to create new technologies. Uh, there was a whole section on the book where they talked about combine combinatorial technologies for example google's driving car 
well, what is it? There's an AI behind it. There's sensors that are visual sensors and sonar sensors. There is GPS. All of these things existed previously before they put them all together in a car. You know, they didn't implement them as a car as a whole. So you can see now with technology, the the innovation is going to come from taking all these different technologies and combining them in new and different ways. Like uh, Waze versus just regular Google Maps or anything else. Waze takes the whole idea of GPS and takes it to the next level. They do all kinds of stuff with their thing. They put in gamification to get more people on it because there's more people on it. They get more uh, telemetry and data. Uh, people tell you whether there's cops, where there's parking. It's it's putting in a larger database of information uh, for the end users. And it's uh, and, and another example of something they talk about, cloud sourcing, where you get a bunch of people to put into something to help innovate it a little bit better. Although that's not so much on the innovation side. That's just, you know, help, helping you find out where the cops are all. <laughs> so you're not driving too fast. Um, so those types of things. But, I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff that they talked about. There's, like, websites that they now have that you can go to uh, to say, hey, I need this this done, it, like TaskRabbit and stuff like that, where you can just go and say, hey, I need this thing done, whatever it is, and then somebody will say, hey, I can do that, and then they'll go and do it. Uh, so new ways of using technology to find the labor and match it with the individual that needs the labor, or whether it's intellectual labor or manual labor. Um, and then uh, they talked a lot about... Um, uh, like NASA had a problem with trying to figure out the uh, solar flares, trying to do predictions of them because they need all the astronauts that are on the space station to go into a safe room in the space station so they don't get bombarded with uh, high doses of radiation. The problem is their ability to predict um, uh, solar flares wasn't very much, and not almost not enough time for people to get into the things. So they put it up on this website just saying, hey, anybody, we'll give you $30,000 if you figure out uh, this problem for us. And so this guy who's like a ham radio uh, enthusiast said, hey, you know, this is similar to something in radio waves, I guess. Uh, I bet if we can apply this that we'd be able to predict it. So it turns out that he was able to predict at like uh, 90, 93% accuracy or something along those lines within eight hours of a solar flare happening. And at 12, uh, at 12 hours, or was it 24 hours, uh, he was able to predict it at 75% accuracy. Um, and they're saying that websites like this that kind of can, uh, where people can innovate because it sometimes it's not within the discipline where the information comes from. It's outside of the discipline um, that they can bring those things together. And they're starting to see these new ways of combining technology and the innovation and creativity of people putting it together to come up with solutions for problems that, you know, astrophysics physicists who work for NASA could not figure out. And the answer, you know, was found by some, uh, you know, amateur radio operator. So this is kind of cool, this type of thing that you're now starting to see in the second machine age, where I think of it more of, and they didn't really say this in the book, but I think of it more as like the uh, automating intellectual processes instead of in, just in, in, automating uh, manual processes. So one of the things that was a key takeaway from the book is that the speed at which change is happening is increasing we're keeping pace with moore's law and if things just keep on growing faster and more compute power and innovation keeps on growing at a faster pace it's growing exponentially not uh, like on a curb things just keep on changing from the time of the writing of this book to now things have already changed so much there's robots on the street they didn't even talk about that that wasn't even on, it was on their radar. They knew it was coming. They weren't even seeing it. Lawmakers are now talking about, you know, having uh, laws or whatever it's going to be for uh, automated vehicles. Um, they're only talking about the, the study that Google was doing uh, driving up and down the freeway. By the way, on that too, they make a big point of this, and I think this is kind of really important also to it, is that. DARPA in 2004 had a contest to see who could make uh, autonomous cars 
and they had like a 100 or 150 mile course for them to go and they got seven contenders that brought their vehicles to um, the uh, starting line you know to try it I mean, two of the cars didn't make it to the starting line. One flipped over at the starting line. The rest of them were able to take it off. But, you know, uh, we're talking about four cars there. Three of them, you know, scuttled out right after they passed uh, uh, the finish line, or I mean the starting line. And one of them actually, you know, made it the furthest distance. It was only seven miles before it went around a corner too fast and, and rolled itself or got stuck in a ditch or something like that. The press at the time and the industry leaders and technologists at the time were saying, you know, DARPA was mistaken in doing this. This is a folly of theirs because this stuff is at least four decades away. In other words, the technology necessary in order for us to have driverless cars is four years away. Ten years later, 2014, Google is – or 2014 or 2015, so – 10 or 11 years, decade, Google is driving up and down Highway 101 with driverless cars here in the Bay Area where it's heavy traffic. And they've got cars driving up and down the roads. So this idea that it was going to take four decades to get here, and it got it got done within a decade. And we're now on the process, which we have, you know, these little drones that are going to deliver stuff and um, – you know, the little cars and robots and stuff that are going to deliver things to us and all. I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> it's here and it's faster than they expected. Uh, you know, the people in technology are saying, oh, this is going to happen. You know, it's going to take four decades for this to happen. It's not. It happened very quickly. And we were talking about, uh, I think it was last week, you were talking about the, what was it, the 50 qubit uh, quantum computer. <laughs> yep. uh, I mean, that stuff is, you know, they were talking about, you know, it's going to be slow for us to get this one. Uh, I was watching a thing online that was from like a year or two ago. How impressed this guy from MIT was that they had a five qubit machine, <laughs> you know, and now we have a 50. It, the, the rate of technology change is mind boggling for humans. and We can't even comprehend it or keep up with it. Uh, you know, uh, Watson went on to have a second career the AI that, that won in Jeopardy. Um, its second career now is uh, IBM is applying it to the medical field. And so um, they're giving the, at the time of the publication they were talking about, uh, they just uh, test piloting, uh, I think, a single um, uh, hospital. And it's not replacing doctors. It's just taking the patient record and all available information uh, to come up with a diagnosis and a treatment plan that, of course, the doctor is also coming up with theirs to see, um, you know, how well uh, the AI is doing on that. Uh, so they're just in the testing phases at the time of the, uh, this book being printed, which is, I think, 2015. Um, so where are we at 2017? Um, not related to the book, but kind of related to AI. I've read an article that in North Carolina, they were testing out uh, an AI to determine whether or not a, a parolee um, or someone that's eligible for parole, whether or not they would be a repeat offender. And so uh, normally that's done by a human being. They go through a bunch of checklists. You know, some of it is, you know, how do you feel this person's going to be? You know, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of reading that... They put the AI to it, and the AI was more accurate than humans as far as how well it thought people were going to be repeat offenders. Well, this, I think that goes to the, the influence of um, behaviors, right? So we as, as humans, we tend to make some decisions not necessarily based off of logic, but how we feel about it, it's, you know, the proverbial gut instinct. And I think that can be swayed one way or another from, you know, the, the board, if you will, that has to look at and evaluate the, the parolee. And, you know, they may say, well, you know, my gut feeling is this person's been on the straight and narrow for the last X amount of years while they were incarcerated. They're not going to be a repeat offender. Lo and behold, what's been happening is the, the parolee, right. Or the, the person who is, um, 
incarcerated at the time, they're playing the system so they know exactly how and what they have to do in order to get paroled earlier. And they're going to do those same tasks, right? And yeah, AI might be able to distinguish it based off of, you know, pattern recognition, but they're not going to have that, that, you know, behavioral gut instinct that we humans possess. For better or worse, right? Either way, how yeah. everyone will play it. Yeah. But it just, that that to me seems to be how AI, in that case, looking at parolees could be, um, have an advantage over, you know, picking out who's going to be a repeat offender and come back and who isn't, just solely based off of the, the data that it sees, and not necessarily a feeling. Well, you know what's interesting, too, about technology and just how we've applied it? This wasn't in the book, but this is something uh, – I read this on the Internet, too um, – that they found uh, people in, like, the, the 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 backwoods. They're just nearly over, you know, caveman type of standards of living, uh, living in the Philippines or Indonesia and places like that, um, where – in Africa, and I think Australia was another place they talked about, um, where they introduced to the natives cell phones. So they're living in mud huts. They're, you know, wearing loincloths. They're, you know, they're doing their hunting all day long, and then they got a cell phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so now you've taken with technology, it's become so universal that now you're having people that are going from the Stone Age um, to the 21st century overnight. And it's interesting that that these people, having grown up around it, all of a sudden get introduced to it, and all of a sudden they're using it the way it's intended to be used. I, I don't know if they're just waiting you know, for dinner to come by so they can hunt it, um, and they're playing Angry Birds. I don't know if that's the case, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you, you you can see what I'm saying, right? So yes. there's this whole new uh, great opportunity for technology to really to take mankind as a whole and, and lift them up a little bit or possibly make them go down because I guess, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, people use a – you can use a tool for good or bad, right? Um, so hackers right. obviously sometimes use it for bad. But it's interesting that that is that, – I don't know that it's causing problems, but it would be an interesting thing for some sociology student to kind of, you know, take a look at that and say, what is the impact of taking somebody from near Stone Age uh, to the 21st century by giving them a cell phone? So the next question becomes, when do we go beyond being, you know, Americans or Canadians or Jamaicans or South Africans or Australians and become the, we're people of Earth? <laughs> Well, we already are. I mean, it's just a label we make. <laughs> right, but I mean, when does yeah. it become I would I wouldn't even say like enforced, but when does that become a a for lack, for lack of a better term, just a label that we apply to ourselves now as a whole because we now have or there may be a potential because we could be on a cusp of uh communicating with others. Right, because there's that whole you know search for extraterrestrial life and all those. It, so then the, the question becomes very similar to what you find within, you know, the the again the worlds of Star Wars and Star Trek, where you're dealing with potential life forms from other sources. Is that even a possibility, or do we just simply say, well, we're just Americans or Canadians or Jamaicans or what have you? Well, you know, it's very interesting because in the last part of the book, they talk about this type of thing, and they say they're not technological determinists. In other words, they don't think that uh, there's a predetermined destiny for us uh, using technology. What they do say, however, is they come up with some recommendations so that we could achieve a society with shared uh, prosperity. And they're not saying socialism or communism. They're saying capitalism is the best place for innovation, and the innovation that we've had up until this point has been greatly uh, pushed by um, uh, um, capitalism. But they think that there's some things that they could do with capitalism to augment it, uh, providing a safety net and some, some other ideas. Um, and one of the things they talk about, which I thought was really interesting, is if society wants to uh, promote a certain activity and uh, discourage another activity, you we, what they 
typically do is they come up with subsidies for the things they want people to do. We want people to go to school, so we're going to give you subsidies to go to school. Uh, we don't want people to smoke, so we're going to put a heavier tax on smokes. So taxing and subsidies are a way to kind of encourage things. The problem that our society has here in the United States, less so in other industrial uh, nations, is we tax labor. And we tax the person who's doing the labor through income tax, and we tax the companies for having them as labor. That increased the cost of having um, individuals working for you. Then on top of it, we, uh, especially here in the United States, we've added health care to that as a requirement for employers. And that's just another form of a tax that is now discouraging employers from hiring people versus hiring machines or AIs that can do those jobs. And so they say, we have to get out of that. We need to figure out a different way of taxing it, not based on layer, uh, labor, going towards something like a value added tax uh, and those types of things that other nations have um, that would help uh, promote or um, not discourage companies from having manual labor or intellectual labor done by humans. Um, and I think that that's kind of one of the really important things in order to make sure that we don't have a dystopia, because if, if the haves and have nots grow further apart and there's no middle class, uh, you're going to end up with wars and all that kind of stuff because people are going to get tired of stuff. And if they don't have stuff and everybody else has everything, um, it's, it's just going to really cause a lot of problems, I think. And I think they kind of end the whole entire book with a whole statement, uh, which kind of follows Spider-Man. They didn't give uh, props to uh, Stan Lee for the, the comment, but uh, they say, with great technological advancements comes great responsibility. And I think that that's kind of uh, going in the direction of what you're saying is like, this technology can make us all better. We have to have, we have to use it responsibly. We have to... Uh, it, it, granted, people are just using it sometimes to make a dime or whatever it is. Um, they say technology is not our destiny. But, you know, here's one thing that Steve Wozniak pointed out. Um, I think it was in a TED Talk when he was in Brussels. He said that when he created the personal PC, he got the idea from his dad that technology was supposed to make our lives easier so that we don't have to work five days a week. We can work four days a week. But here's the problem with that, is not everybody got the memo. So you become more productive. And in the book, they talk about this. They say what you used to do, the amount of labor that you did in 1950, uh, you are so much more productive today that you can get that 40 hours done in 11 hours of the week today. Well, when they wrote the book. So that's so. You, so in theory, we only need to work two days a week, not even that, right? Not 40 hours, 11 hours. But what do all the businesses do? They say, well, you're more productive. I'm just going to give you more work. I'm going to give you more work. That means we make more profits. We make more profits. I can raise your uh, salary. I can pay these other taxes for you. I can make more money. And so what ends up happening is if you were a company that said, I believe in Steve Wozniak's vision. I want a four-day work week. All my employees get Friday off and Saturday and Sunday too. Great. Guess what? All your competitors are going to say, no, I'm going to work my employees five days a week, and they're going to be 20% more productive than you. That means that they're more likely to have uh, better uh, investment opportunities, more clients, more money being made, you know, those types of things. So the, being more efficient hasn't helped us have better lives yet. Just being a bit more efficient. Sure, we can watch any movie we want to watch without, you know, we have a lot more opportunities granted, but life isn't getting easier for us. There's not less work for us. They just gave us more work. Will that continue? Uh, the problem is the intellectual aspects uh, uh, may go away with AI, and so some of those jobs are just going to go away. So what are you going to do with them? So uh, I don't know. It's not it's not a bad book. It definitely has some warnings, definitely talks about there's a lot of opportunities for us. But on the other hand, there is, some. Um, uh, you know, the, whether or not Terminator would ever happen is less likely than the fact that a lot of jobs are going to get lost and people get pissed off and there's going to be rioting and there's going to be all these other things that that's what's really the, the issue.
um, I think. I think you're more likely to see uh, us not get the clue soon enough to how we should handle technology because it's changing so fast and our policymakers don't change that fast. Institutions of government are, they take forever to change. Technology is changing things overnight. I mean, and, and people don't even think, oh, we just want to make sure everybody has health care. Well, you're charging the employers. So guess what happens to that? It discourages having uh, employees. It's better off to have a robot and AI because you don't have to pay health insurance for it. You don't have to pay income tax. I mean, there's all these benefits to it. So we have to really, and the government's not going to change soon. I mean, they talked about it in this book. They talked about it, you know, two and a half years ago. I mean, well, isn't, that what, isn't that some of the same process, like I said uh, last week, like McDonald's investing several million dollars into creating like the ATM kiosk for order taking? Yeah, absolutely. Like like the whole purpose behind that, again, it, it kind of ties hand in hand, right? So one was the push for $15 of minimum wage, and the other one is the push that, you know, the government came out and said everybody has to have health care. Well, if those two things are, are really high or or digging deep into the profit margin, sure, it makes perfect sense that McDonald's is going to do that. Why? Because they can get rid of, you know, seven of the ten cashiers on the line, and you only have the ones that are there in case there's a problem or an issue with an order or, you know, the processing of that order or something like that. And lo and behold, it you've now just replaced you know, seven of these employees. So you don't have to pay them $15 an hour. You don't have to pay, you know, the health coverage. So McDonald's is saving them money, you know? And like you said, it, that's kind of a, a, a behind the scenes push to exactly that, what you just said. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the book's really good. I mean, a lot of people need to read it and they need to understand one, how fast things are changing and two, what that possibly means for the future. There's great opportunities for us to leverage human, AI, robot combined type of things. There's also a lot of disadvantages that we could work around, but it means major changes for how we tax things, how we value things. Um, there's 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 going to be a lot of stuff. I mean, it's it's almost like Star Trek, right? Because you know they're like money. What's money? You know, we just do this because we love doing it. Well, the problem is people still love money and they still want to have their things. There's still Ferengi in the universe, right? <laughs> so, right. Um, so, uh, but we have to figure that out, and we have to figure it out sooner rather than later. Otherwise, big things are going to happen, um, with or without us. So it, it's really interesting. I it. I'm not concerned because I don't think my job is necessarily uh, on the chopping block right away with technology taking over it. But I see a lot of cybersecurity stuff, especially on the analytics side. We don't need people looking at audit logs and trying to determine whether or not that's – AI is going to get better and better and better doing those things. Uh, we may need one person to ver validate what the AI uh, comes to as far as a conclusion. Uh, but I don't think we need, you know, a whole score of people, you know, uh, doing the jobs that they're doing now, you know, running down all these things to determine whether or not, you know, it really is a false positive, false, you know, uh, negative or whatever. Um, I think AIs are going to really shine in those areas. So uh, that'll be a concern. But anyways, I don't know. I'll go become a forest ranger. <laughs> <laughs> that'll work. <laughs> that job's a ways away from being automated. I don't know. Do you guys have anything else or any questions? John, do you have any comments? Yeah. He's been pretty quiet. He's always quiet. I, I know. I mean, the the one thing I think about is as kind of listening to the the discussion. It just seems like whenever these these initiatives come forward to automate whether it's mechanical or AI, the the people that are putting all this stuff together are, are very purpose-driven. So they're thinking about how to make things better, how to, how to make things faster. I'm always concerned with the, the flip side of this, you know, overlooking uh, security, overlooking a, a potential vulnerability in a process 
because when you're trying to create something that's really not your focus you're you're trying to create you're not looking at it from the other side of how you take that and misuse it and and so all these things just they get me they get me pretty concerned you know thinking about uh, the the any of these ai based components where the people putting them together are are really looking at it with the best of intentions to try to make things better uh, but there's somebody else out there that's looking at it from completely different lenses of how to distort it and and do something evil with it so i don't know these things just they always make me think about the, the that flip side but but isn't that true for most of the technology that has ever been invented oh most definitely most definitely you know and then it, it'll be two years from now there'll be some massive vulnerability that get that surfaces and do you do you think uh John, do you think that there's going to be uh, a major security-related thing that's going to put a big stop on innovation in those areas? Do you, do you think something like that will happen? Uh, you know, I don't, because essentially we're, as a society, starting to become numb to the vulnerabilities and starting to become numb to these security breaches. I mean, if you if you think about just over the last couple months, all of the different security breaches that have occurred. I haven't stopped doing e-commerce. I haven't stopped uh, transmitting data electronically, using credit cards, using um, all of these different technology-based things, even though I know in the back of my head that every time I make an electronic transaction, I'm potentially at risk, all the way down to just paying at the pump when I go to get fuel. Uh, I, I don't stop doing it. I almost feel ignorant, like I've put my head in the sand, <laughs> uh, I do know better, but I keep doing it. And that's why, you know, to answer your question, I don't think, I don't know of something big enough that would make me stop um, using all of these technology advancements, even though by all rights, I should know better. Right. No, I, I, I kind of agree with you too, because I, I know a lot of the risks sometimes. And I, I do think I am cautious in some ways, but then there's other things I just like, I just have to accept the risk and continue on because I have to live a life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it, so it's just, it's an odd paradigm to be in, you know, to, to feel like, yeah, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm still going to do it because, <laughs> <laughs> because it's convenient or it's easy. And, and with a lot of rights, I, I probably know more than the average consumer in regards to the types of liabilities that are out there. If if I was even less informed, I don't even know why I should be concerned about paying for fuel with my credit card at a gas pump. Right. It, it doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense. Why, why would I ever want to be concerned about that? Or I, I still talk to people that type their, you know, email people their social security numbers, email credit card numbers over just email. Uh, transmitting data like that and it has no impact to them there's no risk that they even see or feel right yeah it's probably not a good idea to be ignorant of those things well hey i heard a kitten who has a kitten no that's a door oh, <laughs> it sounded like a kitten to me sorry <laughs> yeah that's all right that's a door well that's a that's a good note to finish on uh fake kittens <laughs> yep well, thanks, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. This has been a really interesting talk, and we'll have to take it up uh, next time and see where we go from there. Yeah, definitely. Yep, sounds great. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Trainers Underground. If you have any requests for future episodes, please go to our website, www.learnsecurity.org, and fill out the comment section. If you found this video informative, please like below. We would greatly appreciate that. If you would like to catch a future episode, just follow this channel or find it on our website, www.learnsecurity.org. If you have any comments about the, today's episode, please comment below. Again, thank you so much. And remember, stay safe and secure.